So God is not hard to find. Paul says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he's Lord of heaven and earth and gives to all, every single living creature, life, breath, and all things, all things, everything you have, everything you are has come from God. There are no exceptions. No exceptions. Everything you've got is borrowed. Everything you are is borrowed. God has actually made you and he actually keeps you alive. He keeps you together, keeps you functioning. He's not far from every one of us because in him we live and I can't even raise a finger without him and move and have our very existence. Your existence. How you came into being. Just because randomly your parents got married and out of nothing created you as a combination of their, their, uh, their, their DNA and their characteristics and their genetics. God is involved in that process. And you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. And he has got, got control over all things and over everything that happens in our life by his laws, by his creative power. So let's acknowledge him. Now let's think about God active in our lives. Now the word active, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Not quite. It's all right, I just wanted to have a sneak peek. Me turning around looking at the screen would be the same if I was doing a proper presentation, looking at presenter's mode and seeing the next slide up, okay? So you just, you know that that's just how it works. So why is that the case? Why is there a God and why is he that active in all humankind? Well, because 1st of Timothy 2 verse 4 says, God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that is a universal statement. If it were possible, if humankind would respond, God would want it that every single human being that ever lived upon the face of this earth, in whose lives God has been intimately involved, will be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth. And we're here because we have progressed further than most human beings, sadly, in our response to what God has done. Now, we want to look at the word active. We've looked at the uh, expression God, and now we want to look at the word active. Now, the word active in the, doesn't actually occur in the AV in the word active, but its synonym, work or working, does. Okay? It has the same meaning. And for those of you who love Greek, uh, the word work or working comes from the Greek word ergon, from which we get the English word ergonomics, and energion, from which we get the English word... Energy, very good. Okay, so the idea of the word active has the idea of harnessing and directing energy and power and energy transfer so that there is a force that activates progress, development, improvement and transformation. So that's conjured up in the word active. And this is God's energy and God is the one who's directing it, and he is active in our lives. And I want you to look at now Isaiah 43. You can turn this up with me. Isaiah 43, because this is a good example of God active. And the reason why we come to, to Isaiah 43, because we know that that's the chapter which outlines that God has set the nation up of Israel as a message to the world. Because they are witnesses to something about God. And that something is that God is able to save. Now you know the history of Israel. You learn about it in Sunday school. You listen to talks on Israel. And you know that they are probably one of the most rebellious nations of the world. Despite the privileges that God has given them. The, the Bible is full. Today they're in actual blindness, most of them, that there is even a God. And the nation of Israel is a witness to the world that God 
can save messed up people, blind people, people who are not cooperating with him, people who are rebellious, who keep on doing the wrong thing and have a history of messing things up. On a national level, the nation of Israel is proof to you and me that God has the power to save. Now, Isaiah 43, here we, here we have these words, and they're highlighted in bold, so you can see them. Here's how God was active and is active in the nation of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh that created you, that formed you. Fear not, I have redeemed you, I've called you by your name, you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon you. For I am Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Now that is written to Israel because God wants to send a message to you, young person. That's the truth. Now, it might not be literally true. We understand that. And Daniel's three friends knew that when they stood before, um, was it Belshazzar? Who was it that they stood before? I can't remember. In Daniel chapter 3, he wanted to throw them, the bad guy that wanted to throw them in the burning fiery furnace. You know the guy? That, that's the guy. They said, God is able to deliver us from the fir- fiery furnace. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to your gods. So it might not be literal, but I can guarantee you those words are true eternally for all of God's people. I've called you and rescued you, verse 5, as my sons and daughters from the ends of the earth. Verse 12, I've declared my purpose, I've saved you, I've showed this to the world when there was no foreign power among you that could have saved you. That's why you're my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that I am. Am power, Ael. And you can also be a witness to other people, just like Israel is a witness that God is able to save. Verse 22, you've not called upon me. Here's the weaknesses of this nation that God has made this amazing promise to. You've not called upon me. You've been tired of me. Verse 23, you've not honoured me with sacrifices. Verse 24, you've dished me up your sins. You've worn me out with your rebellion. Verse 25, but despite all of that, despite how badly you've messed up, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression. Think about that. For mine own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That's what can put a smile on the face of people that have failed God. That's the truth, young people. Israel is witness that God is active in the lives of his people despite their weaknesses and failings. He can save, he can redeem, he can forgive and he can blot out your transgressions so that there's no memory of them, there's no record of them. That's the God who's active. That's how he's active. And he's active in our lives. One of my favourite scriptures... He's active in our lives. You know, Romans 8 verse 28 is a promise acknowledged by the Apostle Paul as a matter of certainty. Romans 8 verse 28 starts by Paul saying, and we know there is no uncertainty, there is no, I think so, there is no, it could be, there is a slight possibility Paul says, we know. How does he know? Because he studied the scriptures and he's seen how God has been active in the lives of all that have gone before him. And he's come to this conclusion that all things, all things, not some things, some of the time, not all things, some of the time, all things, Work together for a good end or good outcome or for a good purpose to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. And if I have my 
uh, if I have done my assessment correctly, you are here because you fit into those two categories. You love God, and God has called you according to his purpose. So that means that God says, you can doubt it, you can trust it, you can believe it, you can doubt it sometimes and believe it other times. It remains a fact that every experience you're going to go through in life, God is going to, actually the word work, in the Greek word, you'll know this word, the Greek word is synergio, from which we get the English word synergy. Very good. It means things working together. And you know synergy is actually a, an amazing thing because synergy gives a value to the interaction of the individual components. So, for example, one plus one mathematically equals two. If one and one are synergistically combined, they have a sum total that is more than two because you place a value on the way that one and two interact together and that magnifies the sum of them so one plus one can equal three or more. That's actually scientifically proven. That's the word that's... Someone laugh? It's true. I'm not a scientist, but I read it in a book. So what we're being told here is that God enables and facilitates all of the things that happen to us in life to work together and the way that they work together achieves an outcome and the outcome is a good outcome. So God is at work in our lives and whilst we might not understand it, some things he allows to happen because of laws that he's put in nature, some things he causes to happen. Either way, those that love God and those who are the called according to his purpose have this guarantee. Doesn't matter how you observe things, the reality is God can make good things come out of bad experiences. The sum total of our life is going to have a good outcome. God promises us that. So he's active in our lives, in our very experiences, all of our experiences. And the fact is that he controls the universe and he has everything at his fingertips. He can use people, he can manipulate governments, he can manipulate the weather, he can manipulate he heavenly bodies in order to regulate our lives and make things happen. They're all under his control and he can. If our eye is educated by the scriptures, he can make all things work together for good. Now here's another scripture that is really important about God being active in our lives. Take a note of this one. I love this one. Philippians 1 verse 6. Because here's another thing about God's activity in our lives. God always completes what he starts. And not just completes. The word, um, the word perform in the Greek means to bring to completion perfectly. Now God has begun a good work in you. Paul says, being confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you, God is working in your life, he is active in your life, will perform it, bring it to a perfect completion when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the day of his coming. So trust me and trust God. God is working in your life, whether you know it, whether you like it or whether you don't, he's going to love you into the kingdom and God is not going to stop until there's nothing more he can work with. He doesn't give up on people. Sometimes people will give up on you because your circumstances have made it very difficult for them to forgive, to get over. So it's just easier to walk away. God doesn't do that. He can forgive and he will never give up. And he's going to stick with you until he brings the work he has begun in you to a perfect fulfillment. And that's going to be seen in the day that Christ comes. Okay, next question I have is when does that work begin? Just let me sneak peek. Ah, oh, it's all right. We can have that. So when, when does, because the slide actually gives you the answer, but you're not looking at that because you're looking at me, right? So this is the question. It's an intelligent question. When does that work begin? Does it begin at your baptism? 
Does God begin working in your life when you're starting to learn the truth? Does God start working in your life when you're born? Does God start working in your life when you're conceived? Well, we learnt that from Psalm 139, so that's a giveaway. You already know the answer to that question. But Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 5, tells us that God actually commenced work in us before... This is, this is incredible. The foreknowledge of God is an amazing subject. God commenced work in your life way before you were even born, from the foundation of the world. Here's Paul, Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be God who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He doesn't say a few spiritual blessings. He doesn't say some spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings. Because God doesn't hold back. He is that generous that He holds nothing back from His children. He gives them everything He's got. The all-powerful God. All spiritual blessings. There's no reason why you can't be in the kingdom. None at all. And He's chosen us. So those blessings are in Christ. So we know they're spiritual blessings. They're not blessings that can be attained to apart from Christ. And has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So every single person in this room was chosen by God before he started creating the world and Adam and Eve. Having predestined us, and the word predestinated means to determine the destiny before the time. He's determined our destiny, that we are going to be adopted into his divine family in Jesus Christ, because that's the good pleasure of his will. That is the most encouraging scripture. When you try and make sense of your life, to know that it's not just your life that God has been working within, your lifetime. He has actually made things happen and set things up way before you even came into existence, before the foundation of the world. And we can talk about all of the spiritual blessings. There are many. He's entered your name into the book of life. He's offered you the gift of eternal life. He's designed a personalised training academy for every single one of us so that we can become the kings and priests of the future age and rule the world in righteousness, as our brother Elliot said in his, uh, in his opening prayer. God has a massive vested interest in every single one of you. And if you don't think you matter much to anybody... If you think your life is of little consequence in the grand scheme of things, can I say something to you just personally? That's not true. You are very special. You are special to God. God's not going to do all of that to let you throw it away. God's not going to do all of that just because he has no purpose. He has a purpose. And young men and young women, brothers and sisters, you are the leaders of the world to come. Brothers and sisters, you are the kings and priests of the future age. You're going to be ruling this world and you're going to be creating in this world what God originally wanted. Peace by righteousness. You God's called you for that purpose. So it's not just saving you from death and from all of the curse of mortality. He has a grand purpose. And he's predetermined that purpose. Welcome to my family. It's my good pleasure. Thank you for accepting my invitation. I'm delighted. These are beautiful scriptures. So what has God done? Because there are challenges that beset us, what has God done to assure, ensure that that purpose is accomplished? I don't know how clear that is to you. It looks a bit blurry to me, but anyway. Just think about God active in your life. There are many things that could go wrong. There are many things that could interrupt that process that God has put in place from the foundation of the world to get you to that destiny. 
So what does he put in place? Here's a comforting scripture. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of Yahweh sets up a camp, pitches his tent right around you. Them that fear him and he delivers them. As we said before from Isaiah 43, maybe not literally, but definitely spiritually. God has established a military guard that moves with you, encompasses and encircles you and moves every single place you go. That never leaves you. God's put that in place because he has sent an angel to pitch camp so that you can be delivered from anything that stands in your way and God's way to achieving his grand purpose from, for you. So if we want to know what is that good work that God has begun in us, that he will complete when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a beautiful reference. Philippians 3, verse 20 to 21. We are in a mortal condition. Look at your life and you'll see that we are limited and we are challenged. But the destiny that God has determined is going to be in that day seen when the Lord Jesus Christ changes our vile body so that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby, and here's those three words, I love these words, he is able to subdue all things unto himself. That expression, he is able, is the Greek word dunamis, from which we get our English word, explosive power! That's just the definition. So, that dynamic power forces change and transformation. It changes things. Its dynamic, transformational power changes. The word working is our English word energy. Remember we said before, energio. So God is working by his power in our lives and he's going to transform us. Why do we need to be transformed? Well, here is an example of just some things, because I'm not a biologist either, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a theologian. I'm none of those things. So I'm pretending, all right? But here's some things that I read in a book. So here is our vile body. And for those of you um, who uh, like uh, looking at the concordance and looking at words and their meaning, the word vile just simply means humble or of an inferior state. So when he says he's going to change our vile body... It's a body that is inferior to the spiritual, glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Brother Thomas in Elpis Israel translates our vile body, the body of our humiliation. We are made inferior. Look at all the things that are, that, that are the, the reason why we are inferior to the divine, glorious body of Jesus Christ. That we're going to be changed or transformed into by God's power. We're limited. We're fearful in terms of our mental capacity. We're uncertain, we're biased to sin, sensual, deceitful, wicked, partial, subject to disease, mental disease. And physically, we're limited energy, like you get puffed out and you can't go any further. Well, that's not the divine reality. We have limited senses, we have limited ability, limited lifespan, we're subject to the earth's gravity. We can't fly through the heavens like the divine angels can. We're mortal and subject to injury, injury, disease and death. That's our current state. That's our inferior physical state. And we're going to be changed to be like Christ, a glorious divine body. And God is able to make that happen. God is able to make that happen. And there are three ways that that transformation has to has to work, and it's in this following order. God has to change the way we think. God has to change the way we live. And God, therefore, on the basis of changing the way we think and the way we live, will change our nature. So that's the process. You can't just get to changing our vile body unless you follow the process. So it's mental, moral, and physical. God's got to change our thinking by giving us the knowledge and belief of the gospel. If you're taking notes, Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, there's got to be knowledge and belief of the gospel. 
He's got to change our behavior. We've got to be obedient to the gospel. Romans 16, verse 25 to 26. It's got to be seen in a transformation, changing the way our thinking works, changing the way our life is ordered. And then, of course, the reward is a physical change, which is the purpose of the gospel. Romans 1, verse 16, the power of God unto salvation. That's what the gospel is. So that's the process, mental, moral, and physical. And God uses, this is my summary, God uses three means to make that change happen, to change our thinking, to change our life, and to change our destiny. And it's these three words that are up on the screen. This is how he's going to make that change possible. By education, by discipline, and by experience. Now, let me just see if I've got a slide on the next one. Yep, Romans 10, verse 14 to 15. Really good reference. Um, what time did we start? Where's Elliot? So I need to know my finish time. Okay, so that's when I started speaking? Okay, so that means I've got to finish on o'clock. Okay, so I'm going to be brief in order to get through. Um, I'm halfway, but I'll get through the, the, the next um, half of my talk in seven minutes. That's okay. That's okay. Another thing I'll confess is that I'm very, very bad at organising myself. Okay, so take a note and you can look at this in more detail. Okay, Romans 10 basically says that unless God had made it possible for us to be taught the gospel, we could never hear the gospel, let alone understand the gospel and call upon the God of the gospel. And God has worked in our lives to make that happen. You've either been born into a Christadelphian home where your parents have taught you the gospel or you've been influenced by somebody that God has called in order to make that gospel possible for you to know. And God's the one that's active to educate us by the gospel. You can turn the next one up, because it doesn't matter if we leave a few things. Uh, the next one is Hebrews chapter 11. No, Hebrews chapter 12, concerning discipline, which was the second point on our introductory slide. And if I can just qualify the meaning of the word chastening, which we know uh, Paul uses in Hebrews 12, the word chastening actually doesn't just mean punishing children when they do the wrong thing. The Greek word actually, pedia, is the word we get our English word pediatrics from. So it actually means the training of children. So the word chastened that's used in this section about how God works as a father with his sons and daughters is a word which means to train and develop. It has a secondary meaning, to impose deterrence and punishments, but both of them are to develop the character of his children. And Paul says that's how God will work in our lives to train us, to develop us, and to correct us if necessary because he doesn't want us condemned with the world. So a very important part of God active in our life, educating, training, and developing, Hebrews chapter 11. And the last one is experience. And experience I've taken from Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, where the Apostle Paul says that he's, he's learned by his experiences. Paul was not a natural. He didn't learn contentment, and he didn't learn that he could do all things through Christ, which was the strength that enabled him to get through life. He didn't, he didn't just simply wake up one day and read the Bible and he got it. He learned that by experience, by experiences that pushed him to the limits of his ability and beyond his ability when he realised that he couldn't. But when he knew that he couldn't, that's when he realised that he was able. And he was only able because Christ provided the strength to get him through. So we learn by education, we learn by discipline, and we learn by experience. God is active in our lives in all of those things. Now, to what extent is God active in our lives? Well, I'm going to just tell you a few of the similes that are used in the Scriptures to give you an understanding of how intimately involved and how active God is in our lives. We've looked at the Creator and the Created from Psalm 139. That's one of the similes. There's also the farmer and his trees that are planted and staked and cultivated and pruned and fertilised and watered to produce fruit. There's the builder and stones that are extracted and measured and designed and, and cut and crafted to be placed into Yahweh's eternal house. 
There's the jeweler and gemstones. You know that from Malachi chapter 3 that finds the gemstones and then sizes them and cuts and polishes them and keeps them as his special treasure. So there are many similes that show how active God is in our lives in the scriptures. But I want to focus on three of them in addition to those. Oh, there you go. I've got a slide of them. <laughs> so the creator and the created, the farmer and the trees, the builder and the stones, the jeweler and the jewels. We want to just focus briefly in the few minutes left to us on the craftsman and his workmanship, on the potter and the clay, and on the shepherd and the sheep. Just briefly. You know all of this. So, this reference is a beautiful reference from Ephesians chapter 2. We are his workmanship. And the word workmanship is an inter interesting Greek word. The Greek word bima, from which we get our English word poem. So it actually does mean something that is constructed or crafted, but something quite intricate and beautiful, just like poetry is not normal literary. It's not just writing. It's actually quite purposeful. It's metered, it's measured, it rhymes. It has a beginning, it has an ending. A poem is a beautiful piece of art. And that's the word that Paul uses here. We are God's workmanship. That's your life. That's God active in your life, young people. And he's created us in Jesus Christ unto good works. So he wants to change our behaviour, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. How's he going to change our behaviour? From the wicked works that's native to us, to the works of obedience to the gospel. He's going to do that because he's going to start to work in our lives his amazing poetry. It's a beautiful simile of how God works in our life. Your life is going to be an absolute masterpiece, just like Joseph's was. The man who was, well, subject to pretty bad luck, wasn't he? I mean, every time he did the right thing, bad stuff happened. But you know, Joseph's story is the story of a divine masterpiece. It might not rhyme in a poetry sense, but it has as much purpose as a poem. And I want to tell you, as I stand here before you, and I'm ashamed to say this, it took me a really long time to actually come to understand that what we read in the Scriptures about God active in the lives of people in the Scriptures is actually written for us. Because our life is going to go through exactly the same process. We're going to be taken along the same journey. And you know the destination. We're going to be rulers of the world. Yep. Joseph was made a ruler of the world. So are we. So you know that we're going to end in the same place as, as Joseph did. We might not go through the same pathway as Joseph did, envied by his brothers, I mean, it just so happened that his dad said, go and check out how your brothers are doing. Well, it just so happened that he went to where he thought that they were, and well, they weren't there, so he was lost. Well, it just so happened that there was this man, well, just came out of somewhere, and he just happened to know that they moved over to Dothan and said to Joseph, it's okay, I know where they are, and so directed Joseph to Dothan. And it just so happened that when Joseph got there, they were planning his death. And it just so happened that as they were planning what they were going to do, a group of Ishmaelites were just, well, it just so happened that they were cruising past. And it just so happened that they were traders. They bought and sold merchandise. Well, it just so happened that they were travelling to Egypt. And it just so happened that Potiphar bought Joseph as a slave. And it just so happened that as a result of the seduction of Potiphar's wife, Joseph landed in jail. And it just so happened that when he was there, the butler and the baker were in jail. And just so happened that they had dreams. And just so happened that Joseph was able to interpret their dreams. And it just so happened that two years after, the butler remembered when Pharaoh had a dream, Joseph's king of the world. Joseph saves the world and saves the ecclesia. Just so happened. Don't tell me ever again that you are just so happened because that's not true. This is written in the Scriptures so that God can prove to you that He is active in the lives of His children so that you know what to expect. 
Because you know where God's heading with your life. No different. It's the same story. Might as well have read your name in that record of Joseph's life. Doesn't just so happen. Your life will be a masterpiece of God's making. The next one. This is a beautiful simile. Now you tell me how intricately involved and active a potter is in his piece of, uh, piece of clay that he has uh, taken. If you want to take notes, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 to 18 is a really beautiful exposition of how God works in our lives and how as vessels of clay we're moulded and shaped. And do you know one of the things that I love about this simile is that the hand that presses on the outside of the potter is counterbalanced by another hand that goes inside and delves deep and supports. That's how a potter works. He has two hands. And those two hands are the hands of the one potter, the potter's hand that presses and the potter's hand that delves in to support and provide that counterbalance. They're both the hands of the one potter. And he's going to make a beautiful vessel. He knows what he's doing. And our lives are going to be shaped by the potter's hands in our lives, just like Ruth was. You know the story of Ruth? Well, it just so happened that Elimelech decided to leave the truth because there was a famine in the land of Judah. And, uh, well, he sort of thought, well, where can I go? I can go north, south, east. Oh, I might go to Moab. So he goes to Moab and, uh, well, what happens? Family leaves the truth. A bit sad. Um, well, Elimelech dies. That's a bit sad. He's buried in Moab. That's a bit sad too. It's like not where the family uh, grave, graves were. And, well, Marlon and Chilion married two wives. Well, it just so happens that Marlon married Ruth. Oh, Malbite, but I mean, don't hope. And so it just so happens that Marlon and Chilion died. And so, well, Naomi thinks, well, see, girls, I'm going back to Bethlehem, Judah, because I'm going back to the truth. And Ruth says, ah, I'm coming with you. And, well, it just so happens that as Ruth was there, she just, well, it just so happened that she just, just landed on Boaz's field. And it just so happened that, you know, um, she, yeah, just was busy working and Boaz showed favour to her. Well, it just so happened that when it came to organising uh, the redemption of, uh, of Ruth because of the decease of, and of Naomi, well, it just so happened that the unnamed kinsman kind of didn't want to do anything, you know, that might mar his good reputation. I mean, she's a Moabite and, of course, you know, she's condemned by God and, you know, you can turn the chapter and verse up to say, 10 generations of Moabites can't enter into the ecclesia. So, like, she's like not just disfellowship, she's like disfellowship for 10 generations, can't even come into the truth. Well, it just so happens that Boaz didn't have a problem with that. Well, it just so happens that before Boaz had to make that decision, well, kind of his dad, Salmon, married Rahab, who was a harlot and lived in Jericho. She was a Canaanite. So Boaz had no problems seeing faith despite origin. Well, it just so happened that because of that, Boaz married Ruth. And it just so happened that, well, a man called David, not really important. And, and then the descendant of David's Jesus Christ was born. Just so happened, right? Wrong. It didn't just so happen. So how did Ruth come into the truth? Well, it just so happened, didn't it? So you see, there is a potter and he works with the clay and he can do amazing things. And our time is going. So just quickly, the last one is the shepherd and the sheep. Now, I'm going to have to skip this, but if you're taking notes, Psalm 23, beautiful psalm. It's a psalm written by sheep, actually, about how safe the sheep feels because of the amazing shepherd. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 11, uh, Ezekiel 34, verse 15 to 16, and Luke 12, verse 32, and I'll quote that one. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What an amazing promise that is. Don't be fearful. Your life's going to go through the valley of the shadow of death, yes, but you've got nothing to fear. I'm always here, and I am able. We might just miss this. If you're taking notes, Ecclesiastes 9 is a good place to go to to find out about the hand of providence, and you will learn from verses 11 to 12 that time and chance happens to all under the sun, but for the faithful, for those of us who are the chosen... 
we read in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 1 that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. So there you go, that's where your life is. It's in God's hand. Now there is not a reason in the world and there is not a reason in the scriptures that that will not be true for your experience also. So as we wrap up, The Bible teaches that God has always been active in the lives of all his children. We may not always see or understand what he's doing, but his word tells us what to look for. And faith enables us to trust that he is purposeful in both what he does and what he allows in our personal development because God wants us to become his children for eternity. He has promised to transform us into the divine perfection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we've considered And in that promise is his assurance that he would hold our hand and walk with us every step of the way. Final scripture in conclusion. Ephesians 3 verse 20 to 21. Now to him that is able. Hopefully we've understood that this morning. I don't care who you are. I don't care how badly you've messed up. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. I don't care what your circumstances are, where you come from, how close to God you feel, how much of this makes sense to you. If you are here and you are serious about knowing that God is active in your life, which he is, there's no doubt, here's the takeaway lesson. He is able because it doesn't depend on you. It relies on your cooperation, but salvation is a matter of God's work because he is able. He is the power to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. God doesn't stand alongside and work for us which is also true, he takes one step further and he works through us, in us. So to him be glory in the ecclesia by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.